Welcome. Do you work in New York City? Soon it will be less of a dilemma when you get sick and feel like staying in bed. You will be entitled to five days of paid sick leave. Well, not that soon. A year from now you will be eligible, but only if your company is big enough and only if the economy doesn't worsen. And it'll be five unpaid days of sick leave if your workplace is small, 20 employees or fewer. However, starting next April, it will be illegal for the boss to fire you for staying home sick a few days. How is it that after years of labor fighting for this sick leave protection and business interests successfully resisting it, that it's finally going to be law? Well, today we will examine the untidy way a democracy can break a deadlock. Also on today's program, museums. Should they be free? to help enrich the lives of all citizens. But then how would we pay for them? There's a lawsuit brewing about the 25 bucks that the Met suggests, suggests we pay. Plus today, dancing. We'll celebrate 100 years of flamenco in New York City. But first, sick leave. Why, after blocking the legislation for years, did our city council speaker and mayoral hopeful Christine Quinn relent? The answer involves an obscure city council rule, Gloria Steinem, and Gracie Mansion, among other things. To begin, let's watch this two-minute clip of Quinn at the last minute getting out in front of the parade. I am very pleased we've been able to reach an agreement to pass a paid sick leave bill later next month. Yes! This bill will provide paid sick time and unpaid sick time to over a million workers in New York and provide paid sick time to nearly a million workers. I've always said that I supported the goal of paid sick leave. So the question for me was never a question of if, only a question of when and how, and I'm so grateful to everyone who has worked to get us to this right time in this correct way. People who are sick or who need to take care of a sick or ailing loved one should be able to take a day off without being afraid of losing their job and therefore being afraid that they won't be able to pay their bills. It is simply the right thing to do, what we are announcing today. Like everyone, I've been moved by the stories we've heard of people who have not had this important benefit. Throughout the process, I, along with many of my colleagues who are here today, and Gail herself, have also pressed on the importance of recognizing the impact that this proposal would have on New York City's economy, its small businesses, and its mom and pop proprietors. And I want to particularly thank Gail, who although has been a fierce proponent for this bill, she has always been mindful of that in a very inclusive way. It's been my goal to make sure that when we provide this important benefit to millions of people who need access to paid sick leave, we did it without creating an administrative burden on those businesses that currently offer the benefit when we can least, when they can least afford it. And I've always said that it was vital, <coughs> excuse me, that any paid sick bill protect small businesses and ensure that we move forward only in the right economic time. And I'm proud to say that this legislation strikes the balance of those interests in an important and aggressive way. City Council Speaker and Mayoral Candidate Christine Quinn on the sick leave compromise. It's quite a reversal for her. By the way, standing to her left in the red jacket was Upper West Side Council Member Gail Brewer, who's the lead sponsor of the bill. Let's hear directly from a leading advocate why and how it happened from his perspective. Bill Lipton is State Director of the Working Families Party. Bill has been doing the day-to-day -day work of inching this bill forward for three years. Welcome to the show. And, Thanks, Brian. And I guess congratulations would Thank be you. an appropriate word? I certainly think so. Um, so how much was this your party's doing? How much would you say you picked this fight? Well, you know, when we started the Working Families Party 15 years ago, the animating impulse was always the idea that we're in this together. Uh, and paid sick days is such a perfect example of that, that, that notion, right? Not only is it just unconscionable that someone has to choose between taking care of a sick child or, you know, or losing a day's pay or even possibly being fired, but when they go to work, it actually affects everybody else. Um, so um, 
it was kind of a no-brainer for us that we would get involved in this. Uh, you know, it was about three and a half years ago when we decided to dig in. Um, we actually had a really good election cycle um, uh, in 2009 and helped propel a whole set of progressive allies into the city council uh, and, uh, uh, and other positions. And we thought we were in a good position. And we actually had some friendly conversations with the speaker and others, and we thought this was going to be done pretty quickly. Um, it did not turn out to be the case. And uh, so from your perspective, did Speaker Quinn pick this issue as a way to distinguish herself from other potential Democratic hopefuls as being more friendly to the small business community in particular in New York? Actually, it turns out, Brian, I think it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, uh, I think originally the Speaker's intention was really to try to roll this out in conjunction with some uh, policies that were friendly to small businesses. But what happened uh, around, you know, uh, in 2010 was actually not that much about the small business community. It was really about the New York City partnership and, and some of the bigger entities. Uh, folks who, quite frankly, uh, often pay their workers a lot of money because they're, you know, wealthy Fortune 500 corporations uh, and the their representatives you know uh, often are very well compensated but they really decided that this was an issue that they wanted to draw a line in the sand about um, and you when mean we there went are out, fortune 500 companies in New York City that don't offer workers paid sick leave not at all it's actually I'm saying something a little bit different um, the New York City partnership really decided and they their members are really fortune 500 companies, you know, and, and some of the most powerful corporations in the world that are located here in New York. And they decided that paid sick days was emblematic of the kind of issues that, you know, uh, that they needed to draw a line in the sand about. These mandates, these, these pushes for more rights and more benefits for uh, the working poor and, 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 and folks trying to get into the middle class that, you know, are quote unquote bankrupting our city and causing all these problems. Uh, and what they did was they really went out and really tried to hijack, in my, you know, in my opinion, and my opinion of a lot of people involved in this effort, small businesses to be the face of the campaign. Uh, and so you had a lot of energy, you know, directed at the local chambers of commerce and, and other folks. And, uh, you know, some of them, I, I'm not going to tell you that they love the idea of paid sick days, but the truth is, Brian, the kind of folks, the kind of small businesses that join your local chamber of, chambers of commerce, they're not affected by this bill. They're often upstanding small business owners who already provide their workers a few paid days off, so they're not even covered by the bill. Because remember, this bill is only for, for, for employees that get no paid days off of any kind. This is just a bottom floor for folks who have nothing. Uh, so that they literally, they would lose 20% of their paycheck that week, unlike you or me, if they called in sick. And so therefore they feel compelled to go to work, even if their kid is sick or they're sick. So explain further about the relationship between the New York City Partnership, representing largely the Fortune 500 and other big businesses in New York, and these small businesses who are the ones who complain most loudly that they were living on the margin of profitability and something like this might, uh, right. you know, put them out of business, uh, restaurants in particular. Well, you know, look, there's always the story that you read about uh, and you see reported on, but then there's the story behind that, and which is, you know, has a relationship to that, but it can be a little bit more complicated. And there's a lot of small businesses in this city. Uh, um, you know, so often when you actually spoke to the folks who were advocating and explained to them, you know, you just walk up to them and say, excuse me, do you provide any paid days off for your workers? They'd say, yeah, of course I do. You're not covered by the bill. Really? And that would actually provoke, you know, some confusion on their part because time they do and time it, again. Because they do it voluntarily? Yes. You know, there, there's a lot of small businesses already provide a few, a few paid days off. Now, many of them don't. But the kind of folks who are engaged uh, in their local chambers of commerce, they have to compete against the folks who don't provide any. So mm -hmm. many of them, once you took the time to explain mm -hmm. it to them, were for it. But they were really, uh, the folks who, who were asked to step up and be really vociferous, some of them were absolutely vociferous against this. And I'm not going to lie about that. But a lot of times when you took a, the opportunity to actually walk folks through the bill, they actually had a, a more ambivalent response and often changed their minds. And at the end, you saw local chambers of commerce blessing a deal 
that they had denounced over and over and over again, and the proof was in the pudding there. So we're breaking down the natural history of uh, this messy democratic process of bringing paid sick leave uh, to fruition in New York City Council. And let me tick off the three things that I mentioned in the intro and tell me yeah, sure. the role that each of them played. Uh, one of them is a person, Gloria Steinem. Yeah. So um, this was actually a campaign that had a real plan, and we executed it. You know, uh, We actually didn't end up deviating that much from the plan. Um, and in the beginning, there was Gloria. That was always the idea. Um, some, you know, some core constituencies that we knew were very important to the speaker, and it was because it was really about the speaker, right? We had 38, 39 people, depending on the time, uh, 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 38, 39 council members on the bill. Um, uh, so we knew that women... But the speaker, as one powerful leader, had right. the power to either bring the bill up for a vote and let that majority vote or not. That's, that's exactly right. Um, and, you know, we had had a long dalliance with her doing this bill, do, doing a, a paid sick days bill. And then in, you know, late 2010, she just decided, no way, I'm not doing it. Uh, so she'd been on the fence and torn about it for a while, you know, because Chris, you know, the speaker has a long history of, of doing progressive things. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, in this instance, she actually decided she wasn't going to do it. So we knew that we had to, you know, make the case to her in a forceful way. So Gloria so started Steinem, with Gloria. elder statesman, That's feminist. Right. Uh, presumably enthusiastic about the prospect of the first ever woman mayor of New York City. Yep, that's exactly right. This was, um, on the one hand, you might expect for Gloria for this to be uh, uh, a challenging, a difficult issue that she'd be torn about. And at some level, I think she was. But I have to tell you, for all of us involved in the campaign, uh, we were so inspired by the fact that she didn't hesitate. She just said right from the get-go, this is an issue like choice. Um, this is an issue fundamental to women's equality, and I can't imagine supporting someone who doesn't, doesn't believe in this, for, especially for women, but for all people. The idea that you have, to, you, know, you have to juggle work and family and that you don't have the freedom to be able to make the choice that's best for your family, it's fundamental. And she had an op-ed in The Times that a lot of people noticed. And I think after Hurricane Sandy stalled it again, she had an almost identical op-ed piece well, we that had a, raised the issue anew from her, from her lips, basically. Brian, we had to start from scratch again. You know, we actually did a whole bunch of things. Uh, Gloria was kind of the lead, the tip of the spear, if you will. But we did a whole bunch of things. Sandy just wiped us off the map. We had to start from scratch. In fact, there was... Why a, was that, though? What strong, was the relationship between yeah. the storm and paid sick leave? Well, the, the folks at the partnership really felt like this was, um, in a weird way, like a, a blessing for them. Uh, and, the, and they really started talking to folks and to try to get them out to say, with, you know, w with Sandy, the small business, folks who are struggling to recover with their small businesses, the idea that you'd put an additional mandate on them now would just be, you know, a, a terrific thing a horrible thing and not really uh, uh, at all talking about what about the people you know who are trying to piece their lives together um, uh, so there was a lot of press and pushback on you know on this idea of doing any doing anything for the foreseeable future on paid sick days because of the impact of the sandy of sandy and and, and it was really focused on the small struggling small business owners and, and that you know that, that I'm, I'm not gonna you know argue that they weren't struggling that's mm -hmm. true um, but you know, we always go but back. But you had to, a restart. We had a we we had a restart, and our view was Sandy was not a critical factor because we remember during the Great Depression, that's when you know the the minimum wage was passed. So many great uh, uh, um, important things were, were were passed when people needed them most. Um, so we weren't deterred, um, and then in February we relaunched. Um, Gloria came out again, reiterated her position. Uh, uh, in a strong statement, then Jennifer Buffett and uh, Ai Jen Poo and a whole host of other women, prominent women leaders, uh, signed a statement uh, on a half-page ad in the New York Times that got a lot of notice. Um, then we did a press conference with 15, maybe 20 actually, uh, women elected officials, some of whom were close to Chris, uh, but they felt that this was an issue fundamental to, you know, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, very close to Chris Quinn, published books about issues mm. uh, about paid sick days mm. and paid family leave, 
felt compelled to come out there and really talk about how important this was. So we did a whole host of issues of, of actions to highlight the role of women uh, uh, and paid sick days. But we didn't stop there. Then we actually uh, did a whole series of things with Latino leaders because there's a big disproportionate impact for this type of policy on the Latino community. Um, uh, the vast majority of these people who are affected are Latino workers. Um, so what we did was um, we actually, uh, Community Service Society, which did great work on this, on, on this campaign, you know, the, the leading oldest anti-poverty organization in New York, they did a study about the disproportionate impact uh, on Latinos. And then after that, we had a host of Latino elected officials. Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, who is just a, a, a terrific leader in this campaign, and Senator S. Bayat, uh, came out. Then we did a radio spot, Brian, um, that you know, really Spanish, got people's attention. One. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, we did a teletown hall with Borough President Ruben Diaz, Jr. and uh, Councilmember Melissa Mark Viverito, where 4,000 Latinas uh, got on to hear about the bill. So the pressure questions. was building from yeah, right. here, from here, from here, from here, that's and right. yet it took Speaker Quinn a long time to relent. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and, you know, there were, so we actually laid out, um, uh, there's, there's a couple other pieces to the campaign that were important. Um, one thing that uh, is particularly important is, you know, the role of good government groups, you know, in, in social change. You know, they're the neutral arbiters of, 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 of kind of having, uh, creating good rules and, 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 and making sure that they're followed. But it's so hard to make social change without a strong good government group that's able to do that. And Common Cause and Susan Lerner and Sam Massell over there, they actually really looked at this and studied it and they said, you know, three years of public debate, multiple public hearings, 38, 39 sponsors. Democracy really isn't real until there's a floor vote for something like that. I mean, that is just, you know, uh, this, is, this is not right. Mm -hmm. And they actually put out a, a statement calling, concerned about the over-centralization of power and putting on the spot all the council members, do you think this thing deserves a floor vote after three years? And they put it up on their website and Third, we, you know, we were able all together to get 34 people to go on their website and say, you know, we, just th we think that it, this bill deserves a vote on the floor. And that getting those people on record was very important because that's not something they wanted to say to the speaker, but they felt they, could, they couldn't say no to a good government group in front of the whole public uh, eye. So this motion to discharge, is that the obscure council rule that plays a role? Yes, and there's a relationship between the two things, right? Because with all those people on record favoring a floor vote, then the 13 or, you know, or 14 people who signed the, the, ended up signing the petition discharge felt comfortable. They knew that even if they did, that they did, they, they signed this, this motion. Uh, that, and what is it to find a motion sure. or a petition to discharge? So in uh, 2001, when there was a, uh, I think it was 2001, might have been 2005, but anytime there's a new speaker, there's a chance for people to negotiate different rules. And the last, uh, transition that the, when this happened, there was uh, pressure uh, by the members who were coming in who didn't want to be subjected to, 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 to kind of uh, an overly centralized speaker. They wanted a rule change that would allow them to move things to the floor. So the idea is that the sponsor of a bill plus six other council members, if they sign a petition discharge, then seven days later, automatically, there will be a procedural vote by the whole city council. Uh -huh. So the entire city council will vote whether or not to vote on the bill. And then after that, there will actually be a vote on the bill. So that's a way to bypass that's the right. speaker's power to bottle up a bill. And but it, that happened? But it never happens, Brian, because people are so nervous about, the members are so nervous about all the other things they care about, from their committee chairmanships to uh, their member items. Things that the speaker, any speaker, has the power any to punish speaker. them with. Any speaker has the, the power, that's right, has that power. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of concern. But having those 34 people on the record at Common Cause, it, I think it gave people a lot of uh, 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 courage to know that if they did this, mm -hmm. the procedural vote would probably be very, uh, uh, would, 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 would actually be successful because these folks had already essentially answered the same question. Does this deserve a vote? So that's when Christine Quinn decided to get out in front of the parade 
and staged the event that we played the video of, more or less. Look, I want to give the speaker credit, right? Uh, she could have fought this thing out. She has a lot of things, uh, uh, a lot of uh, 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 power to continue to cast, contest this. She was genuinely torn about mm -hmm. this piece of legislation. Like I said, I've known the speaker a long time. Mm -hmm. She has a progressive record on many issues. I think she was uh, genuinely torn. I think that the pressure campaign definitely uh, 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 helped and pushed her in the right direction, but she stepped up and she, she uh, you know, and, and actually decided to do the right thing. And brokered a compromise. That's right. So are you sufficiently satisfied with this bill? Bill de Blasio, who of course, is running against Quinn for the Democratic nomination, says no, too little. Uh, and these um, compromise elements that we mentioned at the top of the show, 20 employees or fewer, um, exempt, uh, illegal, uh, sorry, um, and, uh, uh, in some cases the sick days will have to be unpaid. Uh, you wanted it really to be for every business or for exemptions only for five employees or fewer. Right. And obviously you wanted it to be paid sick leave That's right. for everybody covered. Are you satisfied? You know, uh, yes and no, Brian. You know, there's the world as it is and the world as it should be. Um, and, you know, at, at this moment, I think the idea that a million people are going to get paid sick days. Uh, one million out of the 1.3 million uh, is incredibly powerful. I mean, when you, I've actually seen people cry when they, you know, they talk about what this bill would mean to them. Uh, if you don't think that people's lives aren't actually uh, devastated at times because they're not able to go to a doctor preemptively and actually take care of something, and then they find out six months later, you know, that thing, if you had taken care of it earlier, it would have made a difference. Um, it, this, that to me is uh, a, a huge accomplishment. And just remember, those other 300,000 people who didn't get paid sick days, they can't be fired for staying home from, for, from work anymore. That's illegal. And the answer is also, so that's why the answer is yes. The answer is also no. I think the public advocate, uh, Bill de Blasio, is right. Because this is really a fundamental this is fundamental. We're the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't provide paid sick days. And like Gloria Steinem said, like Bill said, we're not going to rest till everybody gets paid sick days. So this issue will rise again no matter who's elected mayor in the fall. I, most definitely. Bill Lipton from the Working Families Party, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Up next, the museums of New York, sort of free, sort of not. If you're a regular at some of the city's top museums, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Natural History, you probably know that their recommended admissions fee is just that, a recommendation. But what if you're not a regular? Does the word recommended start to seem an awful lot like required? A new lawsuit brought by two Czech tourists and a New Yorker alleges that the Met has been deceiving the public into paying its $25 suggested fee. That got us thinking about museums and affordability and access, particularly for middle and lower income families. Do we have to shut some people out in order for museums to survive financially? Here from the art world to help us tease out these questions are Joan Jeffrey, whose 40 year career in arts administration has led her most recently to be founding director of the Research Center for Arts and Culture at the National Center for Creative Aging. Next to her is New York City arts blogger, Patty Johnson, founding editor of ArtFCity.com. And joining us via Skype from Texas is Maxwell Anderson, director of the Dallas Museum of Art, which recently instituted a free membership and admissions policy. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And let me begin with you, Patty. What do you think about this lawsuit? Well, I think it's a little complicated um, in the sense that I think you have to sort of begin um, you know, with the question, is it really um, deceitful, um, as is say, stated in the suit, to um, uh, charge a recommended fee when it is um, stated on the, in the fine print that uh, this is, in fact, just a recommended fee? Um, and I think, like, we see all sorts of examples where actually it is maybe a little misleading um, to, you know, the to only read what's in the large print. And I think, you know, maybe a good example for that um, for me recently in New York City was, um, I think like there's like a lace, uh, laser tech um, ad in the, uh, 
on the subways, and that uh, you know asks you like it it advertises a seven hundred and fifty dollar rate um, to get your eyes fixed, and that's great, but it's only per eye. So you see that uh, in the small print. So it's really double that. Yes. And, and and some of the particular details in the suit, uh, they allege that by law, a law passed in eighteen ninety three. Admission is free, but the Met deceives regarding the nature of the admissions fee by one, misleading public statements, I guess similar to the one you were just describing about uh, eye treatments, two, deceptive signage in the entry hall, and three, using admission buttons and blocking access to admission halls um, for those without, and one more, uh, which is interesting if true, training the staff not to disclose that the patrons can pay nothing at all. Yeah, I mean, I think none of those things are are a hundred percent above board. I mean, but I I also think like we have to sort of take in context like what um, is going on for museums. I think like they're talking about ten percent of um, you know their operating expenses being covered by um, these admissions, and that's all. Just ten percent. Well, that's all. I mean, seriously, I think that's a fairly significant amount and that there um, there has been a precedent actually of having to close certain galleries in the Met um, because of uh, reduced lack of funds, lack of funds. Right. so, so no, I mean that's serious no right organization and can easily stand to give up 10 percent of its revenue stream. absolutely not and this is not the first time that this has come up there was something similar in the 1970s wasn't that's there? that's correct yes the American Assembly at Columbia ran a conference and uh, put out a publication in which Daniel Kattenrich told the story of a, a poor woman from the South who came to the Met, went all the way up the steps with her four children, uh, got to the front desk and saw whatever the wordage was at the time suggested, recommended admission, turned around and left. So this has been going on for decades, but I want to add a couple of things. One, except for the three big museums, the Met, the Guggenheim, and MoMA, uh, actually, the revenue from admissions is only about 4%. And um, I, I think Maxwell Anderson will talk to you a little bit about why he felt it was important to have free admission at the Dallas Museum of Art for that. But I think the context is that we're talking about 501c3 nonprofit organizations who do have a mandate to serve the public. But how that mandate is interpreted may vary. Meaning? Meaning this... this particular case may not be about not carrying out their mission as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So does it communicate and is it okay to communicate to a poor family, let's say, that this museum is not for you, even if they're not explicitly intending to send that message? Well, I should say that a lot has happened in 40 years and that museums, including the Met, have become much more diverse much more open to all kinds of audiences, have done a, an incredible educational outreach to get different people into the museum. There are many programs always bringing in classes of school right. kids from all over the right. city. Children who bring their parents and so forth. They have wonderful programs. So I don't think it's the same as it was in the 70s when that might have been an issue. Free Friday nights is another one. Free Fridays in, in many museums that are doing this and some to create diversity. And the case with the Brooklyn Museum was they did First Fridays and they gave a dance party, which they still do. They brought in a lot of the neighborhood, but nobody could actually track whether those people were then going to the museum. Right, so Maxwell Anderson in Dallas, first of all, thank you very much for giving us New Yorkers some of your time. Um, I think it's probably safe to say that very few of our viewers have ever been to, mu to your museum. Uh, so tell us a little bit about it and why you decided to make it mission free. Thanks, Brian. We're 110 years old, and I would guess actually not a few of your, your uh, viewers have been here in that we're the fourth biggest metropolitan area in the country, and we have a lot of tourism that is cultural tourism, but not of the sort that New York enjoys. Our museum is encyclopedic. It's one of the 15 or so biggest in the country, and it attracts five to 600,000 visitors a year with a variety of visitors from throughout North Texas, obviously, and elsewhere. But I think for us, the issue is very different from Manhattan, in particular, as Joan says, the three museums in New York City that draw the largest audience, the Met, the Modern, and the Guggenheim. If you leave those three aside, in fact, a lot of other museums in New York have similar difficulty drawing a lot of admissions revenue. 
and it is closer to 4% for the majority. If you look at the Asia Society or the Rubin Museum or uh, so many other institutions that are worthy ones around New York, they're not on the hit list for tourism. And with tens of millions of tourists pouring through New York City, many of them affluent, many of them seeking cultural experiences, there is a great impetus on their part to walk up to those three institutions and they'll pay whatever seems possible and necessary that's required of them. So do you feel that in a revenue sense that you're going to wind up um, taking in more money for the museum by having free admission uh, than by having something like a suggested admission? Well, let's be clear. We ticket exhibitions, select exhibitions. Right now we have the Cindy Sherman exhibition that the Museum of Modern Art organized. We have a Marc Chagall exhibition that we organized with the Musée de la Piscine in France. And so we do sell tickets, but they're for special exhibitions. The rest of the museum, the vast majority of the museum, therefore, is open at no charge. What we've also acknowledged is that people who will decide to pay for tickets to an exhibition are a percentage. They're not the full uh, collective enterprise of people visiting. But by virtue of the fact that membership at most museums, including the Met, the Modern, and the Guggenheim, is not a great driver of revenue below, say, $100. It only starts above $100 that there's a net return on that investment in real sense. We decided to eliminate the cost of membership under $100 and make it free. And so every day we sign up close to 100 people. We've, we're over at 6,000 new friends of the DMA since we started at the end of January. And what happens with that system is very unusual. It's like a frequent flyer program. The more you visit the museum, the more points you earn. And those points can be redeemed for special exhibition tickets or parking or behind the scenes experiences. So what we're really doing is encouraging people to show up, as Woody Allen said, that's 90% of success. And then we're hoping to convert people who might previously have thought about just coming for free to see the value of belonging at $100 and above so that they can have those benefits all the time. And if a lot of this just started in January, if I have my timeline right, is it too early uh, to report on any metrics yet? It's too early to give a complete sense, especially with Joan there, who is an expert in measuring museum performance. <laughs> but I would say that we're definitely seeing a, a wonderful response from the public, the spring break, for example, that we had from the public school system here in the Dallas uh, area, we had about 32,000 32, visitors over a period of time when last year at the same time we had about 11,000. So we're seeing an enormous uptick in participation. And after all, that's largely what we're about. Art museums, including the Met, the Modern, the Guggenheim, are drawn primarily through their fiscal year by philanthropy, by gifts and grants and foundation receipts and the contributions of wealthy patrons and trustees. And whether it's 10% or 4%, the admissions revenue is not the key driver of our fortunes. So, Patty, do you want to fact check his numbers? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> well, there's another issue that the suit raises besides cost and access, and that is value. Is there something wrong with the assumption that great art should be free? I mean, I think if you own the art, which is sort of, um, I think, the assumption here, we own, this is the public's resources, then, um, then I think, uh, obviously, we want it to be free because we pay taxes. But, um, you know, I, um, I'm Canadian, so I think things are slightly um, different from my background, but, like, um, I've noticed here that people don't like paying taxes that much. Um, you noticed that about yes, the United I, States. Yes, I have figured that out in my um, small amount of time living here. Um, but uh, so I think people like to know where their money is going. Um, and I think, you know, with a collection like the Mets, um, which is world class, there's some of the, I mean, I go to the Met many times a year. I actually go more than I go to MoMA, and I'm a, I run a contemporary art blog, so like the Met is off my beat. Um, but I go there a lot because I think the, the collection is incredible. And, you know, in those cases, like I also, even though I'm press, I pay for it. Um, I, I don't pay the full amount because I'm poor press, but I, I do do that. And um, I do that because I think it's really important um, that uh, the museum have as, as much 
you know, support as I can give them to uh, run their programs because this isn't, I mean, it, to me, I think it's a very, very special collection. Um, and there's so many works. I mean, the uh, Van Gogh, I had spent a lot of time in college looking at reproductions of Van Gogh's and thinking, like, what a cliche artist he was. And to go to the Met and really understand what those paintings were about, and really understand, like, what the, um, you know, the Greek and Roman statues look like and, and, and were, were really um, significant, mm -hmm. very significant for me and Artistic for what I do. Experiences. Can I, can you, I add something to sure. this? Sure. Okay. Um, first of all, in some pricing theory, people think free is the wrong price. So, I mean, this is an argument always with the Shakespeare Festival, uh, which ostensibly is free, but if you actually pay $100, you can actually get a seat. Yeah. So there are these kinds of arguments. The other thing I think we need to recognize is that almost every museum has a free day, which is covered by corporate sponsorship or a foundation, which is advertised, which does let the public know that they can come without paying. So is all this a tempest in a teapot, as far as you're concerned? I don't know. I think it's much more complicated than it looks. And I think it's not, here, here are the bad guys and here are the good guys. Well, and for better or for worse, I think we do, um, when we pay for something, we attach value to it. Um, and so I think we've seen that. Um, I think not totally a comparable example, but we've seen that a lot online with the sale of, of art where, um, we've seen it become a lot more accessible because there are sites like 20 by 200 that um, produce, um, you know, prints that anybody can have access to for a low, very low price point, and people purchase things. I mean, it's a very different experience and in sometimes museums. Sometimes established but musical artists give away new tracks for free, and they wind up making more money as a result. Exactly. Um, so, Maxwell, do you think that part of the upshot of all of this, of what you're doing with your pricing structure in Dallas, will be to make art relevant to more communities, whether you want to define that socioeconomically or however, uh, who may not have found it relevant in the past or of declining relevance, because I know all museums, so many museums are struggling, um, you know, to compete against the internet, to compete against contemporary culture in so many ways. Uh, and, and is it going to be a point of outreach that you hope will pay revenue as well down the line, but will also just, you know, help art survive? Well, I certainly hope so. You know, and I, I would say we're right down the street now from a new museum uh, of science, nature and science, the Perot Museum, that is a colossal, beautiful building, which is a, an attraction. And people are accustomed to paying for attractions like that. Art museums are intimidating by definition. People don't know what to wear to art museums. They're afraid they're going to be quizzed when they come in the door. They're afraid they're going to feel ignorant if they're not sure what something is. So we have a much higher bar in making ourselves relevant in people's lives and a choice they can make versus the park that's right across the street from the museum or the science and nature museum down the street. So to us, it's essential to look at the ways in which we can be relevant to the city and the, the people of this region recognizing that like so many other art museums around the country, we don't have the benefit of the tourism that the Met, the Modern, and the Guggenheim enjoy. And so a pricing structure here is completely different from what would happen most logically in New York, and especially at the big three museums. Well, thank you all for having this conversation with us. And long live the great museums. For sure. Thanks. Absolutely. You're here. Up next, and somewhat related, grab your castanets, 100 years of flamenco in New York City. Now we commemorate the 30th anniversary of the dance company known as Flamenco Viva Carlotta Santana. A new exhibit at Lincoln Center called 100 Years of Flamenco in New York City is the first flamenco exhibit ever curated in the United States, we are told. It is running from now until August 3rd at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. It is my pleasure to welcome K. Mayor Goldberg, master teacher, and dancer, as well as flamenco scholar and co-curator of the exhibit, and Jan Schmidt, the curator of the Jerome Robbins Dance Division at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank and you. we're going to show you all some fantastic images and videos uh, coming up here in just a minute. But talk about flamenco for a moment. Uh, Mira, is it from one cultural tradition or from a combination? 
So flamenco comes from Spain, and uh, what we have been looking at in this exhibit is um, how much of America there is in flamenco. Um, flamenco has always been part of the image of um, Spanish culture. When people think about Spain, they think about flamenco dance and the castanets and all of those things. Um, flamenco comes from the south of Spain, and it's a it's a hybrid form that basically began in about the 19th century. Um, it's one of those urban forms that, you know, like the tango and like, you know, jazz um, that was developed when people moved to the cities. Um, and it's a Spanish form, but there's always been a presence of America uh, mm -hmm. in flamenco. And that's one of the interesting things that we found in making this and, exhibit. And so, Jan, why does the exhibit celebrate 100 years of flamenco in New York? Did it arrive in the city about 100 years ago? Well, actually, no. It came a little <laughs> before that, and, and the exhibition is actually a little broader than mm -hmm. that. We had expected to, you know, we, when we were trying to get the theme in the beginning, we decided on 100 years, but then, of course, when you start digging and pulling out the roots and, and looking at stuff, there's always the bit before, and, of course, it will go on way later, longer, mm. and so forth. And there were really more than 100 years of solitude, too. <laughs> yes, there were. I see in our guys' book. The, the, uh, let's see a video that excerpts a few uh, Carlotta Santana Company flamenco pieces, and these are more contemporary in style, and this is a real treat. Check it out. So, Jen, people could see that or something like it at the exhibit? Yeah. The, oh, there's amazing amounts of material in this exhibit. It took them uh, years of looking through our collections to find materials include, and outside of the collections. But the video, there are three monitors, and two of them over, have over an hour worth of clips from er the earliest Thomas Edison films in the eight, late 1900s and the late 1900s, I'm getting the years mixed up. <laughs> 18, 18, 18, late 1800s. 1800. And we're gonna show one of those in a minute. We're actually gonna show an 1890 flamenco yes, video in yes. just a minute. Um, but where would you say that what we just saw fits in to the history of flamenco? Because this is also to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Carlotta Santana Company. And I'd say that had a, a fairly contemporary feel exactly. and some of the costuming and some of the movement. Yes, exactly. So, for example, you saw that one segment where she was wearing a very, very long train and they were playing music from Carmen in the background. And the movement was very kind of a mixture between contemporary mu movement and traditional flamenco movement. So in traditional flamenco, for example, you often work with a long train. The train comes from the 1870s but it's now a, a stage element that people can play with. So we see them playing jump rope with the fabric, for example, and that's a contemporary um, take on this traditional. So that's what Carlota's company is very much involved with doing, is bringing Spanish uh, artists and American artists together and bringing uh, movement vocabularies and kind of theatrical ideas um, from the United States as, as well as from Spain and traditional flamenco all together. So let's look at some of the uh, images, still images, from the exhibit. 
and I'm going to ask you to walk us through some of these. So, Jan, do you want to start and tell us what we're looking at here? Well, uh, first of all, when they started the um, to do the research for this project, they started going through everything that we have. And these are, I think the first few here are some dry point uh, drawings. This is Fanny Elsler, who was a very early flamenco um, variety dancing person. So she, yes, she was a ballerina. She was actually a, a, a ballerina. She was Marie Taglioni's rival. Right. Marie yes. Taglioni was the first dancer to go on point at the Paris Opera. And Fanny Elsler came and she learned a Spanish dance called the Cachucha from some Spanish dancers that came over from the opera from, from Madrid and taught her the Spanish dance. And she took it and just ran with it. She was known as the pagan dancer. She came to New York in, in 1840. And she had a great a couple of years touring all over the United States and really did a lot to, uh, to form uh, the uh, American idea of Spanish dance, which really first came into the ballet world before it came into before flamenco existed, um, Spanish dance was was kind of an offshoot of of, of the ballet world, mm -hmm. and she was the one who popularized that in the United States and gave us our ideas of what Spanish dance That's is. That's great. That's a great history with that one slide. And what's this next one? So this is Antiope. This is Carmen Sita, who uh, was a, a dancer who came as we move into the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Um, Spanish dance really is in the variety shows and the vaudeville um, houses. And um, American producers would go over to Europe and bring back dancers. And Carmen Sita, Carmen Dosé, was a dancer that um, was brought over. She danced at Coaster and Beals, which was a beer Gar pleasure garden in New York and uh, she danced in a variety show which was Antiope um, and she was the uh, sort of specialty act and we're seeing her and dance this is now. her yes this is from 1894 94 yeah yes. and uh, she is this is the first woman ever filmed um, on camera dancing on camera and she, it's very, very interesting because you could look at her, her movement and you can see what the steps are that she's doing are part of the classical uh, Spanish school of dance. And Jan, from a filmmaking perspective. Well, it was the first, Thomas Edison doing the first films. And what was the, that he was going to use? Trains that move and dancers. Yeah. Thomas Edison shot that? Yes. In his studio in New yeah. Jersey, yeah. yes. Incredible. And right. If you're looking for simple movies. things that convey to the public that had never seen movies before, that here we have this new medium, and look what it can do. It can make sense to you. Yes. Uh, flamenco dancer, that was a still camera. I don't think the camera moved there at all. Yeah. Uh, but so beautiful to watch, and it's, oh my God, look, we can see her dance. Yes. And the shot of the train, the, sh the, short, the famous short film of the train, yes. very similarly. Yes. Tell me about this dress. So this is um, Argentina. She was the first person who really tried to bring Spanish dance out of the burlesque and the music hall and onto the concert stage. And um, she, uh, this was, I believe, 1917. This is from a piece uh, called Sonatina by Hafler. And she, uh, what Argentina did was she uh, put together many different kinds of dance onto uh, Onto, into one program. And this was a piece that had many different kinds of Spanish dance, and one of them was the gypsy dance, and that's what this is a picture of. So she is uh, portraying the gypsy. So, well, let's go to another slide. We have another one, and this is so much fun. Let's just keep scrolling through <laughs> some of these. Jan, you want to well, start? Well, this is, this is the Messine shot. This is a... Um, Screenshot from a Messine film. Uh, Leonid Messine, the famous choreographer, was um, studying to sh shooting Spanish dance for his uh, ballet La Tricorn, and he he shot this, which I think we have a clip of. Is it? No, 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 we, no don't we don't. Oh, okay, probably, probably the because the, the one of the issues with the dance division is we have twenty four thousand videos. We would love to put them all online, but the rights don't stay with us. Mm -hmm. And Messine did did that shot 
and yeah, so she she was one of the famous. So if the the uh, Spanish dancers were brought over to the United States, the gypsy dancers who were darker in color um, really didn't come over to the United States at the turn of the 20th century. And Macarona is uh, one of the great dancers of the turn of the century, and she this footage is a precious. Uh, uh, piece of, of footage that only exists in the library, to my mm -hmm. knowledge, and it's in the exhibit. You can go and see her dance. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 So we're going to zoom ahead all the way to 1918 <laughs> and look at this picture. <laughs> uh, this is Tortola Valencia, um, and she was a dancer who um, was a very beautiful woman, and she was uh, she's a, of Spanish descent, but she was raised in London. And uh, sort of at the beginning of the century, when dancers started doing, uh, taking uh, different ethnic forms into the modern dance uh, canon, she started doing um, concert presentations that would include a snake dance, and they would include an Egyptian dance, and they would include an African dance, and a Spanish dance, and um, yeah. And pulling all those in. All right, one more. We have about a minute left. Famous poster, Jan. Uh, Carmen Amaya, yeah, we're working at going into the 40s. Uh, this is another example of the kind of materials that the dance division has, which range from film and video through uh, artworks and dry points and programs and posters. And this is the kind of thing that the three curators, uh, uh, Carlotta Santana, Lamera Goldberg, and Ninochka Benaham, same, worked same to person, find. Right? Same person. Yeah. And, Tell, is that a face? <laughs> she was the first gypsy performer to take the international stage. She's very important because of that. She came in 1941, and she broke everything. She broke the stages, and she broke the, the mold for what flamenco, uh, what we thought flamenco was. And basically, ever since Carmen Amaya, when we think of Spanish dance, we think of flamenco dance. So just remind us, Jan, where can people go? When can they go? What can they see? The, um, it's at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts in the As Vincent Anster Gallery, and we're, it's open Monday through Saturdays, and it's open through August 3rd. And be either required or suggested admission? No, no <laughs> admission whatsoever at the New York Public Library, including for looking at the collections, any of the materials that you see in the exhibit. If you want to see more, you can always come up to the third floor and see the films in, in full. And there's also public programs that we're doing in connection with the exhibit. And they're, they're, the next one is April 15th. Right. OK. Well, people can look up all those details online. online. And just to be really clear, we're talking about a New York Public Library for performing arts. This is not the one with the lions. This is actually at Lincoln Center. Right. Yes. It's a fabulous place. It it's is. Music collections. It's just an amazing Yes, amazing music, place. theater, theater so, on film and tape. Yes. Thank you very much for sharing thank you. this cultural history and thank exhibit you. images with us. Okay. And that's our program for this week. We premiere a new show every Wednesday evening at 7.30. Next week, our public intellectual segment tackles the apparent decreasing legitimacy of science among conservatives as measured by surveys over time. And tune into my radio program weekdays 10 a.m. till noon on WNYC 93.9 FM and AM 820. Tomorrow we begin a four-part series on recycling in New York City. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.